Well, it's good to see uh, Charlie and Rhonda back from Ukraine. How are you guys feeling? Feeling all right? <laughs> How many hours straight were you up? 24, 25 hours? And, and they, as many of you know, they went over to um, work toward their adoption of Artem. Thanks, Mitch. Um, who, I guess, one more trip over, Lord willing, and that process will be complete. And so continue to pray that things uh, go well there uh, as they adopt him. And then also, uh, Peter, I uh, saw Peter in um, Walmart yesterday, and this is their last Sunday um, here with us. They're moving back to Canada permanently, so they won't be back in Bainbridge um, that they know of. And so make sure you get by and, and say bye to them. Um, before uh, you head out. Raise your hand, Peter, for those who might not know you. And uh, I, I won't try to pronounce your last name. Van Newsom. What is it? Close enough? Van Newsom or something. Yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, it's, it's how, many, how, many, how many letters long is it? 16 letters long. Yeah, so that's, that's a big last name. There you go. Hey, um, yeah, a few years back now, like about 19, 18 years back, we took a, a vacation over to Jekyll Island. Anybody been to Jekyll Island? And we decided to rent one of these things right here. And I, I don't even remember what they were called, but, but we decided to rent one for maybe like a 45 minute. I think you rent them by 45 minutes or an hour and do, just do a little quick loop around part of the island just to have a little good time there with Shelby. She was just uh, probably about a year old. And so Michelle and I and uh, Shelby was going to sit between us on the seat and just have a, a nice little stroll. This was uh, midsummer, uh, June, July, and as you know, you know, very, very hot outside. And so we, we headed off on our little journey, and probably about an hour into this thing, we realized that, you know what, we weren't circling around the way that we thought we were supposed to. And uh, I'm notorious for being terrible with directions, and I think even we had a map there to try to follow, but it wasn't working out. Well, fast forward three hours later, it took us four hours to do this loop, which I don't know actually what we end up looping, but we looped a, a, a good deal at an island right there. And I don't know if you've ever been there and rented one of these things, but I mean, this thing was like built the turn of the century. I mean, it didn't pedal well. It was hard work. Every pedal after a few minutes of doing this was just exhausting. And, and, and we just were, were drained after this thing. I mean, this was like just the worst trip imaginable. But now you look back and, and such great memories made from those moments. But have you ever started off with something that seemed like it was going to be just, you know, a, a, a very doable thing, and then when you get into it, you're like, whoa, that's way more than I, you know, was, I, I thought it was going to be. And this kind of the passage of Scripture we're dealing with today. If you remember back before we had Grace Goes Global, I tackled a smaller portion of Scripture and kind of pushed part of this to the future. Well, today it's called up with us, and, and so we're looking at verse 6 through 22 of Ephesians chapter 3, and not only is that a long passage by verse standards, but this is one of the toughest passages in all the New Testament. It really is. In fact, one commentary said just first 20 alone, there could be over 300 interpretations, okay? And I'm not going to go through any of those 300 interpretations so you can rest. And even for those who start to get nervous around noon, I've, I've set my alarm, a silent alarm in here. It's going to tell me when it's uh, 10 till. And so um, you can be rest assured that I'm going to be quitting at a certain time, whether we get through it or not. But, but this is going to require you, even during this time frame, to kind of put on a, you know what, I'm, I need to really focus on this difficult passage. I just can't exist here and be here today and expect to get this. And we say this a lot of times here at Grace, but, you know, it would be really easy to just give out a good little application point today. And, and we all feel good with a, a warm, fuzzy story, and we walk out. But we realize, and we know, if you've been here at Grace long, we say this a lot, that God changes us from the inside out. And so as scripture comes into our hearts and into our lives, it changes who we are as people. And out of that comes the behavior. And so many times, and, and we talked about this in our children's class, which next week will be on week five. And if you've missed it, you need to come join us even in these last two weeks because it's great stuff. But we talked about it again today that how that we can get our children to conform to a certain moral behavior or standard. But if their hearts don't change then it means nothing to God as far as them doing anything um, that's, that's, that's beneficial. In fact, it's probably just the opposite of that. And so we're, there's nothing wrong with good moral behavior and having children who behave themselves and control themselves and do the things they're supposed to do. That's great, right? But is it coming from a heart that's right? And Johnny mentioned today, you know, how that even in his own home that, you know, he, was, that he did all the right things, but when he got off on his own... His heart wasn't where it should be, and it was later on he came to Christ. 
And so many people find themselves in that situation where you're just trying to follow the morals, but you're not truly living from your heart. And that's who I want to speak to today. I want this to speak to everyone. But those who are sitting here and you're thinking, you know, I, I don't think my heart's where it should be. Or maybe your heart's never been turned to God ever before. And so as we look at this scripture, you're going to have to do a heart check and see, do you want Jesus? Is this journey worth it for you? Are you willing to invest in your relationship with God and understand that if you're truly a believer, as I said during communion, that Christ lives in us. And the Holy Spirit illuminates God's word and makes it come to life in our lives. And so as we study today's passage, I hope that you will really, really engage your mind and your heart to this. Let's kind of recap because it's been a few weeks since we've been in Galatians, but we've been talking in the book of Galatians how that Paul is preaching a gospel of freedom. He's saying that Christians, they don't need to depend upon the law of Moses. They don't have to depend upon circumcision for their salvation. That salvation is through Christ alone, and it's through Jesus becomes the power to live through the Holy Spirit to live out the life that he's called us to live. And he's, this whole book is focused on that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the majority of the early Christians, we've said, were Jews. And so they were really struggling with this dual identity because their culture, their heritage, all these things, everything had been changed for them. In Christ, it was, it was all new, that it wasn't about doing certain things to make um, to feel like you're doing what God has commanded you to do by going and, and, and sacrificing or by being having your children circumcised. This wasn't how you earned favor with God. This was not what God required because Jesus paid the debt that we couldn't pay. And that, and that system that was in place, Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. And he fulfilled all those commands that we couldn't keep. And so last time we said that, that Paul was making a personal argument. He said... Think about it. When you came to Christ and you received the Holy Spirit, was this through circumcision or was it just through believing? Well, the answer was obvious. They believed and they received the Holy Spirit, the Gentile believers. They didn't have to go and be circumcised in order to receive the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit when they had put their faith in Jesus. And so today he moves to now making a scriptural argument. And this is where it gets really tough because he's going to go back through a lot of Old Testament passages and he's going to look and, and, and talk about these. And, and, and some of it's very, very difficult to follow, but I hope you'll hang in there and you'll um, follow with us. And so today in 6 through 22, he's going to show us that God's covenant with Abraham and God's covenant with Moses find their fulfillment in Jesus and his salvation. So his covenant with Abraham, we're going to look at we're going to look at his covenant with Moses, and then we're going to see all that comes together in Jesus Christ. Now, today is Family Worship Sunday, and so all the kids should have received a handout. And on there, we got a little quiz, and adults, we're going to test you two here and see if you can follow along and get these right. So we got some pictures, and we're going to help jar your memory a little bit about who Abraham was and who Moses was. So go with the first set of pictures there, all right? So we got these th first three pictures Adults look at those pictures too and kind of see who's who there. So we got number one, and who is that? Somebody, one of the kids, yell it out. Who is that on number one? Moses. It's Moses, right? That's Moses at the burning bush. All right, number two. Who is that? Abraham. Abraham. Why is it Abraham? What's he doing? Right. That's where God commanded him. To, he said, "Go and to offer your son as a sacrifice." Now we know if we you've learned the passage that he didn't actually have to take the life of his son; that God provided as a substitute. Great symbolism there for the future for us. And then three, mark that on your handout. But yeah, who's that? Moses. Moses. Why do you know that's Moses? Yeah, Ten Commandments. Very good. Those Roman numerals, right? All right, number four, five, and six. All right, mark those on your page. Four, five, and six, and we'll move along here. Number four, somebody yell that one out. Moses. Moses, that's Moses, yes. Number five, a little tougher. Abraham. Abraham, because why is that Abraham? Because we know because his parents were what? Very, very old when they had their first child. In fact, Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 89. And then the last one, what is that one? Moses, Moses and the Red Sea. All right, three more, all right. How are we doing on this? Y'all getting these all right? All right. Seven, eight, and nine. A little tougher on seven. Why do you know? Man, you guys are good. Mitch didn't even get these right. Yeah. 
Yeah, very good. He was counting the stars, right? And, and, and so the stars, God came to Abraham and he said that your descendants would be like the stars in the sky that you can't count. Just an, an incredible number. And you remember Abraham, you know, I don't have any children. How could that be true? Number eight, a little tougher as well. Abraham, Abraham very good. Why is it Abraham? Very good, yeah, Sarah in the background staring out, the three men came, and that's where she was uh, kind of seeing what was going on there, and she said, there's no way I can't have children. She even laughed, we'll see later about that. And then number nine, that one's kind of easy. Moses. Moses, and that was where what? What happened? One of the plagues, yeah, the frogs, yeah. All right, so let's catch you up to speed a little bit on who we're going to talk about, Abraham and Moses, and those who are newer to church, don't feel bad if you don't know all the answers there. But, um, you know, we want to learn and study the Bible because it's God's Word, and it, it gives us life, and, and understanding the stories of the Old Testament, they all point to who? They point to Jesus Christ, and that's why we love to study the Old Testament. So God's covenant with Abraham, we're going to look at in verse 6 through 9. So, so if the Judaizers, these people who were saying that you had to be circumcised, if they uh, were saying, hey, circumcision is required, what Paul does here, he says, let's go all the way back to the Old Testament, let's talk about Abraham, and let's see if that's the case or not. So we're going to look at verse 6 through 9. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to, to, sorry, credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed among, along with Abraham, a man of faith. So what word do we see over and over again in that passage? We see the word faith. And so Paul says that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. And all those who have faith are sons of Abraham. And as Scripture prophesied long and long before, God would justify the nations, particularly the Gentiles here he's pointing to, through faith. Thus, those of faith are blessed along with Abraham. And so he points to this, this story of Abraham, and he says, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him for righteousness. All right, I need you to remember something, kids. I need you to remember the number 17, okay? Remember the number 17. We're going to look at Genesis 17, and we're going to look at verse 11 through 12, because we're going to all the way back to when God originally came to Abraham about this idea of circumcision. As I told you a few weeks ago during Children's Worship Sunday, if you don't know what circumcision is, that's one to ask your parents, okay, later today. All right, so verse 11 to 12, it says, You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. So that happens in chapter 17 of Genesis God comes to Abraham, and he, and, and he says, you must, be, uh, you must be circumcised, and from here on out, on the eighth day, every male child must be circumcised. And so, here's what Paul wants to point out. He's pointing out that that happened in 17, but we have to go back a few chapters to God's original call to Abraham. We're going to go back to chapter 12. What comes first, 12 or 17? Kids? 12 or 17, which one comes first? 12, very good. The Lord has said to Abraham, or Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord told him. And then we're going to skip three chapters forward to chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15. Again, 15 comes before 17, right? This is God coming to Abraham before he was circumcised, and he says this, and this is really important. He says in chapter 15, he says, verse 1, he says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in, Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you, must, you have given me no children, so a servant from my household will be my heir or my descendant. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son 
who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And this is the key verse that Paul points to in verse 6. He says, Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul's making the point that Abram, Abraham simply believed God, and that was credited to him as righteousness. Fourteen years before he came to him about circumcision as a sign of that covenant. So circumcision was a sign of this covenant between Abraham and God. So did, did Abraham at this point do anything when God called him to earn or deserve this? No, he didn't do a thing. He believed something. He believed something. And so God promised to bless Abraham, even though he had done not a thing. In fact, more than likely, Abraham was probably a pagan at this time when God initiated this and God came to him and God made this covenant with him. And so Abraham's re- re- story, what Paul's getting at, it reminds us that by grace alone, God blesses his people. By grace alone, God blesses his people. Grace is not earned. It's all about God. Grace is not earned. It's all about God. And so as we think about our salvation this morning, we know we didn't do anything to deserve it. We weren't in the right place at the right time. We think from a human standpoint, you know, it helps my odds that I was born in America or in in North America. But the truth is, God can seek you out wherever you are. And God's grace comes to us, not because we have done anything or deserve it at all. It's all him. And that's what Paul is pointing out through Abraham. He's saying that God is going to bless the nations through Abraham, who didn't have a single heir at this point, and Sarah, his wife, Seemingly unable to have a child, and this seemed like a huge problem, didn't it? But God, it wasn't a problem for God. Why? Because God extends his grace to Abraham, and this grace is expressed in radical promises. Radical promises. If you're following along in your handout on the back of the bulletin, write that in because that's key. Radical promises. God promises Abraham all these offspring, and he's old, and he's childless. But God says, by grace, I'm initiating. I'm coming to you. You didn't do anything. This is all me coming to you. And now I'm going to make this radical promise to you. And the prospects don't look good, do they, for Abraham and Sarah at all. But this wasn't really about Abraham and Sarah at all. It was about God. And it was about what God was going to do. It was about his grace and his promise. Abraham had nothing to bring to this. He was old. His wife was old. Seemingly unable to ever have children. So God initiates. So what do we respond? What did Scripture say? How did Abraham respond? He believed. He had faith. He put his trust, his hope, in what God had said. Because it's through faith alone that God's people receive his blessings. It's by faith alone that God's people receive his blessings. And so I think about this, like Buzz and Sharon in our own house here, that they left and they went off to a far away place. Why did they do that? Did they do that because they wanted to earn extra points with God? Maybe God will be happier with them? Not at all. Because God came to them and God called them. God said, I'm going to bless you if you will take these steps of faith and go and do this crazy thing. And they believed that God was true in what he said. And they followed, they obeyed. And the Judaizers, these people in in the church of Galatia, they did not like this teaching at all. Why? Because they thought, if all I have to do is believe something, what does that lead to? It's going to lead to uh, the law being just, it's totally abandoned and people are just going to be a a free-for-all. They can just live however they want and just, as long as you believe and have faith, that's all that really matters, right? Because it doesn't matter what our behavior is because it's just about believing. But they didn't understand that True faith always expresses itself in radical obedience. Get that. Write that down on, your, on the back too because that's important. True faith, authentic faith, faith, real faith always expresses itself in radical obedience. So back to Buzz and Sharon. If they said, I believe, God, that you're calling us over to Liberia and Africa, but they're still sitting here in the pew today, is that obedience? Absolutely not. Is that faith? Absolutely not. Because 
True faith, authentic faith, always responds in radical obedience. Let me illustrate this for a second. I'm going to get Othan to come up here and help me. Othan, uh, I prepped him that he was coming to help me today, but I didn't tell him what he was going to be doing. So come on up here, Othan. And how you doing, man? That was a good jump. You nervous? Just a little. All right. Tell me about yourself. How old are you, man? Seven, about to turn eight. About to turn eight. All right. Uh, Mitch is bringing us, uh, uh, Mr. Mitch is bringing us over a TV here. Just set that right there. That's good. All right. That's a pretty big TV, isn't it? Would that look good in your room? I'm not giving it to you, by the way, so don't get your hopes up. But it, 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 that's a pretty big TV, isn't it? All right, let me ask you a question, all right? What if I told you, okay, what if I said, Othan, what I need you to do is I need you to tear up that TV. What would you think? I would say no. You would say no. What if I told you this? What if I said, Othan, look at me. What if I said, I talked to your mom and dad. They said you're allowed to do it. I really want you in fact, to tear up that TV, what would you do? I would still say no, but I can plug in and watch TV. So you can plug in and watch TV. All right, what if I said, Othan, I really, really, really want you to break that TV. I really want you to do it. In fact, something better is going to happen if you break that TV. What would you do? I would give it a chance. You give it a chance. You give it a chance. All right, hold that thought for a second, all right? Hold it right there. All right, so God comes to us and he says, do something radical, do something crazy. And we think, God, that's not such a good idea. And then we say, yeah, I will do it. Maybe, all right? All right. Then God says, okay, follow through on what you just said you were doing. So it's one thing for Othan to stand there and say, yeah, I would tear up that TV. But you know, he wouldn't really do it unless he actually does it, right? His, his faith is just in his head. He's saying, yeah, I would do it, if, you know, if, if, you know, but will he do it? The moment of truth says if he truly believes, then he's going to follow through and do it. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll let you off the hook. I, I'll just let you know, though. That TV was already broken, okay, so you can, Mitch has been after me to get rid of it anyway, because it's broken, it won't work, and so if you hit it, that would have been okay, but we won't do it since, you know, you're kind of hesitant. You made the point anyway. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. it. Isn't that the way we respond? Yeah, I'll do it, God. Well, maybe, you know, now that it's actually right in front of me, maybe not. Well, maybe later. Keep convincing me. How about your life? Where are you at in your life right now on that? Is God saying, time to step out in faith? Sure, God. And then the opportunity is there in front of you? Maybe, maybe later. Or let, me, let me think about it more. Let me see. See, that's what the Judaizers did not get. They were scared to death that if the law was removed, that it would just be people living any way they wanted to live. But when we have Christ in us, the Holy Spirit within us, leading us to the, the good things that God desires and to his word that gives us life and truth, we're confronted with a standard higher than the law could ever have given us. As Jesus pointed out over and over again in the Gospels, what do you say? He said, you've heard, it said, don't commit adultery. But I say, don't even look at a woman to lust after her because you've committed adultery already. He's saying, it's not just about your behavior, but it's about what's in your heart too. It's not just about doing the stuff. It's about your motives behind what you do. And it's one thing just to conform to a set of rules and regulations is another thing because Christ lives in you and I and his Holy Spirit is within us that communes with God the Father that we respond in obedience to whatever he desires for us to respond to. And we obey the simple commands of Scripture given to us by the apostles in the New Testament. But yet we say, yeah, I'll do it. You know, I think back on what I mentioned a couple of weeks, or last week about Buzz and Sharon, and, and Buzz and, and, and Charles alluded to this, that, 
um, that they're, they're really having a tough time right now. And, and I emailed Buzz last week, and I said, you know, what do you need, man? I mean, really, if you could just one thing. And he said, I need a person over here. And I, sh- I shared that last week, and for most of us, we kind of chuckle. Yeah, right. But here's the thing that the way it works is God comes to people with radical things. Because if it's something that we can manage and do on our own, it wouldn't be by faith, would it? And I don't know if, if, if God truly is calling someone in here to that ministry for a period of time. But only you know what God's working on your heart with. And so I don't want to ever say, you know, that's beyond the realm of possibility. And so God comes and he says, trust me. And look, we learn throughout, the, throughout Scripture, and this is important, faith is not always just perfect, okay? Just like Othan up here, he, he, you know, I don't know if I should really do it. I mean, even in the story of Abraham and Sarah, what did Sarah do? She stood there at the tent and she laughed to herself and said, how can this old, worn-out woman have a, have a baby? Impossible. But the thing is, God delights in exposing our inability. He intentionally puts his people in situations where they come face to face with their need for him. God, this is, this is too big. This is beyond me. Well, now I got you where I want you. Because he gets the glory. It's not anything that we can do. Muster up. You know, it's, it's one thing to stand up here and talk about this. It's another thing to live it out, isn't it? Because we know He's put us in places that are difficult, that are hard, that cause us to rely upon God. And therein is the point, relying upon God. And we receive his blessings when we trust by faith in what he says. One of my favorite passages when it comes to faith is Mark chapter 9, verse 24. And in this this passage of scripture, um, a man comes... And he wants his son to be healed. He's possessed and he's having these convulsions and foaming at the mouth and everything. And, and the man actually brings his son to the disciples initially. And they can't heal him. And then Jesus said, I can heal him. Do you believe me? And the man responded. He said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe, but help my unbelief. And what a great reminder for us. That sometimes it's not perfect faith. Sometimes we're going to be, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But as we, our relationship with God grows, and as we see that he is worthy of trusting, worthy of depending upon, and ultimately everything that he asks of us is for his glory, and it's for our good. And at the moment, it doesn't seem like that. Like, I'd love to have that TV in my room, but instead I'm going to bash it right here. He didn't know it was broken. God knows the situation through and through, in and out. He says, trust me. Trust me on this. I'm definitely not going to get through this entire passage, and we're actually going to wrap it up right here. But I just want to bring it back home to Jesus Christ in us. As we look at next time and in the future about Moses and the Old Testament and the law, as Paul goes on to share, they didn't have Christ in them. And God wanted to expose their inability to live up to this standard of his holiness that we could never measure up, that we could never pull it off. And it's the same way that we live our lives. Not just for salvation that we understood when we came to Christ. It's all about you, Jesus. I can't earn. I can't get there. I can't do enough good works. I can't keep your law. I fall short of your glory. But then what do we do? We say, okay, I put my faith in Christ. Check. Done with that. Now I live through self-effort, through willpower. It's still all about Jesus It all is, from start to finish. Our daily life is about a relationship with God that's real and it's personal. 
and it changes us from the inside out. It transforms our thinking, our desires, our passions. And I wish it was overnight, don't you? But it's not. It's a process. But what are you doing? Are you, are you investing in your relationship with God? Because if you're not, you're going to be bitter. You're going to be frustrated. And all this is going to seem like a heavy weight upon you. But when you turn it over to Jesus, when you come to the cross, you see Jesus for who he is and what he did and accomplished on your behalf. And there's no condemnation now for you. There's no guilt. There's no fear. But God lives in you. And you hear and you respond by faith. Just like Abraham. He believed God. And it was credited to him for righteousness. And that's Paul's point. And the same is true for us. We believe God. Because of what Jesus did on our behalf. He took the wrath of God. So we don't have to. He took the punishment that we deserve. By his stripes, we are healed. That's why we can celebrate and realize that when we look at the cross, it's such an amazing, amazing thing that we never, ever get tired of. Because it's our life, it's our hope, it's our everyday existence, it's our relationship with him. God, I couldn't come into your presence. I couldn't approach your throne, as Hebrews says, boldly, without Jesus, what he did on my behalf. I would still be back here offering these sacrifices, trying to keep all these commands that were impossible to keep. And I'd still be doing that if it wasn't for Jesus. But because of Jesus, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that gives us life and hope and truth. And God, I, I pray that you help us all to truly, truly see that it is about you from start to finish. God, for those who are just struggling just to, to, to spend time with you and to know you and to be still before you and know that you're God, God, I pray you'll help them to make the decisions through your power and through your strength to carve out time where they can truly be in your presence. For those who feel burdened down, and in fact, church and religion seems to add more heaviness because it adds guilt and frustration to them. God, help them to see that that's not the salvation they've been called to, but they've been called to a life of freedom in you. And God, for those who truly, as they look at their heart today, they know there's never been any kind of transformation. There's no desire, true desire, to follow you, to know you. God, I pray that today will be a, a personal time of checking up on themselves and examine themselves to see if they're truly in the faith, if they truly have a relationship with you, even if it's someone who's been here for years and years, God, and they know that it's all been on self-effort and not upon you. God, I pray that you, you will convict their heart. For those of us who just, we just need to live each day by faith and trust you, even in our weakness and, and in our crying out to you, God, that we believe, but help our unbelief. God, help us just to realize that you are trustworthy and your words are true, and we can live on the, by those and through them. We thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.